You are listening to Single Service. My name is Arno Marturay, and I am your host. Single Service is a podcast dealing with design, architecture, business, and city building in which I interview an expert on a specific subject matter. Together, we dive into that topic and challenge conventional thinking in a thought-provoking conversation. I sincerely hope that you will find these conversations as engaging as I did and learn a thing or two in the process. Don't forget to send us your comments, criticism, and praise. To do so, you can email us at hello at rvltr.studio or leave a comment online. You can also subscribe to the podcast on our website at rvltr.studio. Kimberly Selden is the founder of Kimberly Selden Design Group, an interior design firm with offices in Toronto and Los Angeles. In addition to her design practice, she runs Business of Design, an online learning platform she started to help other professionals in the design field to become financially successful with the stated goals that designers running their own practices should aim at making six-figure salaries. I wanted to have Kimberly on the podcast to discuss how she and others have accomplished that as financial viability should be the foundation of any design business. So thank you very much, Kimberly, for being on the show. Oh, I'm thrilled to be here. I hadn't anticipated doing it from the car. So thank you for accommodating that, Arno. I appreciate it. That's no problem at all. So let's start with the easy question. And can you tell us who you are and what you do in your own words in three sentences or less? I am an interior designer, so that's first and foremost, and I run a thriving, busy business with offices in Toronto and Santa Monica, and Business of Design got started because I wanted to teach other interior design professionals. That sounds great. So how did you come up with Business of Design? What's the genesis? Well, the genesis is me failing miserably at running an interior design firm, believe it or not. Uh, I had all these clients because I was on television as an interior design expert. So my phone was ringing off the hook. I had an unlimited supply of clients wanting to work with me. And every project started the same way with the clients super excited and enthusiastic about the project. And it ended the same way with the clients less than enthusiastic about hiring me and not so enthusiastic about the project. And along the way, it never was the case that the clients didn't like me or didn't think I was trying. They all could see that I was really trying, but I did not know how to run a business. And I certainly didn't know how to run a profitable profitable business. I didn't even know that I was allowed to want to be a profitable business, if that makes any sense. It does, absolutely. So was there a kind of haha moment for you where you cracked the code of being financially successful? And if so, what would that be? (laughs) That's so good. I'll tell you the no aha moment, which is when I hired my first business coach and she said, can I take a look at your P&L? And I didn't know what that was. (laughs) I was thinking like Procter and Gamble, like what? (laughs) So that's where I started from. So nobody started lower down the financial savviness pole than I did. Um, But I believe the aha moment came for me after working for over two years with a business coach. And she was trying to get it into my head that if I didn't have systems and process to run my business, I was never going to be successful. And I just, I wasn't buying it because I was creating. Creative. And don't you understand, creative people, every project is different and every budget is different and every client is different. And I just couldn't make her understand that while systems were great for Starbucks, they wouldn't work for me. And we had a fight after a couple of years and she literally threw a book at my head. And the book was a tiny little book called The E-Myth by Michael E. Gerber. Mm. And I read that book. And I thought, well, I'm through with her. She's an idiot. But here's this little book. I'm going to read this book. And I read this book and I got it. For me, that was the aha. Okay, I can see now why I'm going to need systems to help me run my business and how I will not be profitable until I have those systems. And that's a great segue into my next question because financial matters are often, and it's a broad generalization, 
generalization seen as um, something you shouldn't really talk about that's dirty or being profitable is bad or whatever the case may be. Um, but why do you think being financially sound is so important for design businesses? Well, it's important for any business. How can you be a business if you're not, you know, hitting at least some measure of profitability? If you're not doing that, then you don't have a business. You have a jobby. You have a little hobby that's, you know, you you makes you feel good and puffs you up in some way. And I was underperforming on every level, but the financial aspect is the part that's so crippling because you can't, at some point, you can't keep doing it if you're not profitable. And in addition to that, I think there was this feeling that um, it was embarrassing. You know, it's kind of, it's kind of shameful and embarrassing when you're going to your accountant at the end of the year and you've been working full time and your accountant says you made $30,000 this year and, and you're celebrating because you've had years where you lost money. And then the accountant says, do you realize that $30,000 is minimum wage? And I'm like, no, that, that can't be right. You know, because I'm, I'm working like a maniac. Like there's no way I could be making minimum wage. And then you do the math and like, that's minimum wage. And in the interior design community, which is my wheelhouse, most interior design professionals are making minimum wage or something just a little bit higher than that. So you're and talking about net income, right? Net income. Yeah. yeah. So which is for listeners after tax, not the gross income. Yeah, exactly. And I wouldn't even have known to ask that question, you know, 20 years ago when I started with my business coach, because the business training I got in interior design school was abysmal. It didn't prepare me at all for running my business, not at all. And in fact, there was even kind of a feeling that as maybe it was partly because I'm female, it was almost like I had to be apologetic about wanting to make money, that somehow that was greedy or I'll give you a really good example, Arno. In our business, we we have a model where we charge our clients for the services they want to buy. So some clients want to buy your interior design services and you want you to do the design and the drawings and all of that. And some clients want you to do that. Plus, they want you to procure all the goods. Plus, they want you to hire all the trades and do all the trade management. Well, those are three different services. And for the longest time, I felt like you can't charge clients three times times, right? Mm -hmm. That's, that's not fair. But in fact, yeah, you can, because those are three separate services. If they don't want all three services, then charge them for the services they want. But if they want all three, they need to pay for all three. And so it was it, like, I had to overcome a lot of, you know, crippling money mindset, if you will. And I think that's a good segue into the topic of value versus cost. Um, because, uh, I, too, too many, maybe even most designers still charge by the hour instead of charging by the value of their work. Uh, do you have any thoughts on that? And, and what would you advise designers to do? Well, it's so interesting because I know a lot of people love a value fee, a based fee or a flat fee as we call it. But in our business, too often that flat fee is a race to the bottom. It's how low do I have to go to get you to hire me? How low do I have to go to get this job? And so we actually do recommend that interior designers who are just starting out start always start with an hourly fee. But the trick is to actually capture all the hours you're spending. And we're just using hours, the increment of time is a stand-in for our expertise. I have to charge for my expertise. So I'm using this increment of time to charge for it. But if I document every single hour it takes, and then I'm willing to bill the client for every single hour it took me to accomplish the job, then I will have some understanding of what that flat fee or that value-based fee might be. But most designers are suffering from the creative entrepreneurship problem, which is that they're afraid to charge too much. They desperately want the job. So often we're thinking about, wow, this is going to look amazing on my website. I can't wait till I see the pictures. And so what am I going to say to this client to convince them to give me the job? And it's okay if I don't make a lot of money on this job, because for sure I'll make a lot of money on the next job. But of course you tell yourself that lie for years, 20 years, 30 years, 40 years. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. 
so so let's go back to the the idea of uh, being financially sound and, and understanding how money works and and the difference say between gross income net income and all the rest of it I think I'm I'm not mistaken if I say that most businesses and maybe even more design businesses are reluctant to acknowledge that. Why do you think that is? Re reluctant to acknowledge the, uh, the the importance of being financially sound and, and live in that kind of bubble that you described you were in before you had that haha -ha moment. Yeah, that's such a good question. I don't know. I've made up in my head, and this is probably not true, that more women suffer from this feeling that they're not supposed to make money than men. That may not be true, but I certainly got different messages growing up than my brothers did. My brothers were told, you can be anything. You're a captain of industry. Go in there and demand a raise. And I was told, be quiet. Don't rock the boat. Nobody likes a mouthy broad. Like I, I got very different. Why I think it is. And then I think another part of it is The, we all need to be taught how to run a business. I mean, there are enough entrepreneurs now that that should be something we're taught from a young age. And financial savviness is something we need to be taught from a young age. There's a huge difference between making a million dollars in income and making a million dollars in profit, right? Those are, mm -hmm. those are different worlds. Yeah. And too often, interior design professionals who say, oh, yeah, I made, I made a million this year. And I'm like, oh. You know, that was your take home pay. And they're like, no, that was my revenue. Oh, then you didn't make a million. You didn't, you didn't come close to making a million. Yeah. Right? And if the overhead is 950,000, then you didn't, you make 50,000. So exactly. in, in that respect, why do you, what do you think is the number one skill that's lacking in the industry um, that leads people down that path? skill or knowledge or, or tidbit of information that people may need to have? I think we just need to be told from the beginning, if you're going to open a business, it must be profitable. And it should be profitable in the first year, in most cases, not in every case. I, I've got a, a friend who has a huge uh, tech company. and he, he had a five-year plan to be profitable. But for most of us, opening a, a small professional office, we need to be profitable within the first year. And in order to see if I'm profitable within the first year, one of the things I probably should do is take a salary off the top. Mm -hmm. I might not be able to take it my first three months in business, but I sh certainly should be able to take it after six months. And if I had, if I had done that when I first started out, I would have known much sooner that I wasn't making enough money to cover the salary. But mm -hmm. not doing that meant that I had to wait until the end of the year when the accountant said, oh, by the way, you didn't make any money this year. I can't, you know, it's not going to be any salary for you this year, right? I would have known it much sooner if I'd taken it out earlier. So I think having a plan to pay yourself some amount of money from almost from day one is really important. Yeah, I think so. Um, I, I'm certainly an advocate of that. I yeah, I, I became familiar with the um, profit first method a few years ago. And that was a revelation because that's yeah. exactly what they advocate for. It's like, uh, put your profit, which is a basically a percentage of your revenue aside and your salary first, and then keep the rest for all kinds of expenses. And it, it's It's very powerful, actually. Um, can you so can you speak a little bit to the disciplines that you teach your your students or or however you want to call them um, for for becoming profitable and running a, a tight ship? Well, so the first thing we talk about is to create systems to run your business, just like the Michael E. Gerber talked about. So you have to have for every single point on a project. There has to be a system that helps you navigate that point in the project. How you answer the phone, how you sign a client up for the con for the consultation, how you deliver the consultation, what happens after the consultation, what happens when it's time to hire the trades, how do you hire the trades, what do you charge for hiring the trades, what's your markup on what you're going to charge for hiring the trades. All of that stuff has to be part of how you show up on day one to every project figured out so that the clients can then relax and let you run the project. And once I was able to start getting those systems in into uh, my bag of tricks, if you will, 
the clients were responding in a really positive way. Oh, we like the way she handled that. She did she did what she said she was going to do, and she did it on time, and she did it on a specific budget. We like that. And then more clients would sign up and want that. And so it took me more than a decade to figure out what all the steps were to running a project from top to bottom. And then Business of Design was born because I just started telling designer friends what I was doing. And then little by little, a designer friend would say, oh, can you come and talk to my ASID group? Can you talk, come and talk to my decorating club? Can you come and speak at the school? And I was spending more and more of my time going to these events for free and teaching people how to do it. And it became untenable at some point. I'm flying to Vancouver. I'm flying to Los Angeles. I'm flying to New York and I'm doing these classes for free. I'm like, wait a minute, this is costing me a lot of money. I'm teaching people how to be profitable, but here I am spending my own money to fly to all these different locations and teach them how to be profitable. Mm -hmm. So I started feeling the, that in my bottom line, in my design firm, because my design firm was paying for all of these trips to go and help people run their design firms. So finally we said, this isn't tenable and just business of design was born. And it was just really, it was a way of covering my costs so I could go to New York and teach other designers how to run the business. And it's really pretty much remained that. It's never been my, you know, my big profit driver. That's my interior design business. I make a lot of money in my interior design business. And business of design is kind of my passion project. It's my gift back. I see. So you answered the question that came to mind. It's like, which one makes more money for you? But uh -huh. that's a very no personal contact. question. <laughs> um, so how do you... How do you teach your clients to break the six-figure barrier? Because that's kind of like the goal you set for them. I know you've talked about the systems and we've touched on that, but um, is there anything else you want to add to that particular question? Yeah. I mean, first of all, I give them permission to make money. That sounds small, but it's kind of a big thing. There are literally, in fact, we had a coaching call today. We do it once a month. It's called BOD Live and all these designers show up and somebody said, my client says it's not fair if I charge design fees and procurement fees. So it's like, no, that that's totally fair. You buy a cell phone, you get a phone. You don't get text time and you don't get roaming and you don't get, if you want those extra services, those are extra services. So first of all, we give them permission to do it. But second of all, I show them how I do it. I open my books to them and I show them, this is what I charge my clients. This is what my contract says. This is how I make money. And so we're kind of unapologetically making money. And we found that as people are willing to share that they're making more money, the bar gets higher and higher. We actually have, I mean, for so many years, I dreamed of every interior design professional making six figures, meaning finally at the end of the year, $100,000 in profit. Like, come on, we can do it. Well, we are now at the point where we actually have designers who are making seven figures. So I think there's no, it's no small thing to give people a path to follow and to make it happen. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. So in the in the course of my work, I, I often bump against and sometimes internally struggle with the fact that um, I will relate what you do with a marketing problem that I see all the time, which is the inability to convey the value of the services to the client. And, and there's many reasons for that. I'm not gonna go too much into details. But um, how do you think, um, or do you help people overcoming that? Or how do you think uh, designers should overcome that to become profitable? Because I truly believe that's one of the main, main impediments to profitability. I think you're right, actually. I really do. And so what I teach is that I have to portray to my clients this this confidence that I have the expertise to run their project from top to bottom. Everybody's familiar with how renovating projects work. And everybody thinks renovating projects go like this. The contractor tells you it's going to be $100,000, but really it's going to cost $200,000 and then it costs $300,000 and it takes twice as long. And everybody accepts that's how it is. 
Well, we came in and we said, no, that's not okay. I don't want to be that person. I actually want to tell my client how, what it's going to cost and how long it's going to take and tell them that I will manage every detail. If you put your trust in me, I can guarantee you it will start on this day and finish on this day. And this is what it will cost. But that means you leave every detail with me. And there are clients who are willing to pay for that. There's value in that because the work mm -hmm. is complicated. So you just have to have that system that you can rely on and say, this is what I'm bringing to the table. A lot of design professionals think what they bring to the table is I can make a room look beautiful. That's not a big thing. Millions of people can do that. When mm -hmm. I say to my client, I can guarantee on time, on budget, they say, sign me up for that. I'll take that. What's your uh, success rate on, on your projects on being on time and on budget? Well, 100% actually, because I have a way in which I tell them what it's going to cost once I know what it's going to cost. And I tell them how long it's going to take once I know how long it's going to take. So I went from in 2000, I would say I had a staff of 15 I had probably a hundred projects that year. I probably made four clients super happy and made, you know, many of them sort of happy and made a whole bunch not too happy at all. And none of, no client from that year, not a single one ever came back to work with me again. Mm -hmm. Fast forward today, I know I make a hundred percent of my clients happy and almost every single client comes back to me at some point for more work. So, so I, that's big deal right I, uh, yeah and i love your your message because it's it's a very positive one so instead of being uh you know because a lot of designers are like discouraged by how difficult it is to run a business and how some clients can be difficult to deal with um and so it, I'm, i'm glad to hear that there is a possible path for people to take and become profitable um Uh, and I know what you offer is probably challenging even to the people that sign up for your program. So what what kind of uh, attrition rate do you have between first between the people who actually sign up and people who complete and become successful designers? It's really interesting you say that. I'm not I'm not the best designer in the whole world and I'm sure as heck not the smartest person in the whole world. So the program that I teach is really easy, if you will. It's simple. Mm -hmm. Follow the steps, do exactly this. It will work for you too. There is a component of putting, having the confidence to put yourself in front of those clients who can afford your services. That is, a, that is a component. But the fact of the matter is once you have these systems behind you, you are more confident. You are a bigger player and you will get better clients. We have a really, really high rate of just designers who have completed the program and make a whole lot of money. And we have something like, I, I don't even know how many, at, at least a hundred, but um, at least a hundred testimonials on the website of people who say, I double my income, I triple my in income. But I would say over the years, we launched in 2004, I would say by now we have a thousand testimonials of people who say things like that. Mm -hmm. So And given that we don't advertise, we don't, we're just a little, you know, a small company still, there's three of us, sometimes four of us, uh, it's great. And our mission statement is to transform the industry one design business at a time. And that's really what we focus on, just that one person who's in front of us. So let's help. If we can help that one person, they'll probably help someone else. And it's gratifying for me to see the kind of changes that have happened since 2004. And I know we've had at least some small part in, in some of the positive things that have happened. And that's great. So um, I have just a couple more questions for you, because I think we covered a lot of interesting ground. And obviously, people who want to know more can um, find you. We'll, we'll get to the where they can find you at the end. Um, do you, are there any success stories of some of your clients that really stand out to you that you, you'd like to share? Oh, gosh. We now have a coach in Sydney, Australia, a wonderful one named Jody Carter. I'm sure she wouldn't mind me sharing this. But when she came to us, she was 
really on the verge of quitting. She was just broken. She said she can't do it anymore. Her, her clients just won't get in line. They won't behave. She can't make money, blah, blah, blah. And now today, and I think this is only like three years later, she is one of the people who's approaching a seven-figure profitability is one of the most sought after designers in all of Sydney and is now coaching other BOD people. That's, she's just one of so many like that. Like literally today we did this BOD live event and somebody posted in the chat, oh my God, I can't thank you enough. You've changed my life. And that's kind of how it feels. You know, you're so isolated and alone in this business sometimes you need somebody to say it's it's okay you're going to be okay and you can do this it's not that hard um the business is hard but once you have the systems if you just stick to the systems you're going to be okay that's a very positive note to end on so are there any um parting words of wisdom you want to share with the audience before we wrap up oh wow don't be afraid of your numbers just jump into those numbers. You can do it. I know it can be scary. It can feel like this new technology having to uncover and get familiar with my profit and loss statement freaked me out. But now it's such a good tool that I use all the time. I know my numbers. I know my profit not margin. Um, do whatever it takes to get past whatever phobias that you have built up over the years, whatever made up stories you have. So you can get really comfortable with the money. You, no matter what business you're running, you have to talk money and you have to talk it with confidence and ease. And so um, if I honestly, if I could do it, anybody could do it. That's That sounds great. So where can people find you if they want to get in touch? Oh, businessofdesign.com. That's easy, that, right? Yeah, Some it's easy. Um, what was your favorite part of this interview? <laughs> Oh, what a good question. I think I love that you started off talking about why people may not have the freedom or the know-how or even the understanding that they can be financially savvy. That sounds great. So I want to thank you very much for your time and your generosity. I really liked uh, talking to you and Maybe we can have another one of those in a while. That would be great. Thank you, Arno. Thank you so much. Hey, Arno here. I hope you've enjoyed this episode and that you'll come back for more. Please share with your friends and colleagues and remember to subscribe on our website at rvltr.studio. Until next time, ciao.